Welcome to another episode of the True Crime Tales. Before we dive into today's show, please smash the subscribe button so you can get notified instantly when our show comes out. Thank you, for you will not want to miss an episode of our true crime stories from around the world that will grab your interest from start to finish. Sit back, relax as Ava will bring you today's episode. Thank you, Eric. Today's episode of the True Crime Tales is the case of Brian Koberger and the possible murder of four University of Idaho students. November 13, 2022, was a dark day in Moscow, Idaho, on that day four innocent lives were brutally taken. The four University of Idaho students Ethan Chapin, Zana Kernadal, Madison Morgan, and Kaylee Gonzalez were found violently murdered in their off-campus home in what's being called a crime of passion. Seven weeks later, 28-year-old Brian Kuberger was arrested on four counts of first-degree murder and one felony count of burglary in connection with the crime. Brian Kuberger studied criminology at a university near the murders, but what was their connection? Yet, as of now, no trial date has been set. What is the prosecution doing? What is the defense doing? What do we think the defense is going to do? Will they seek the death penalty? Will he waive his right to a speedy trial? Both of those things have been answered already, but then the discovery and everything else involved and what is the defense going to do? Brian Kupperger studied criminology at a university near the murders, but what was their connection? He's on social media, he's looking at the victims every time they're doing videos. Was he present? Criminals now use this if you can imagine the example of predators started by peeking in windows, sneaking around neighborhoods, and following people. Now they just use the internet. How many burner accounts did this person have? That's basically what they're dealing with there. Social media is designed for people to look at each other. This is the new singles bar. You don't know who you're talking to on social media. This is the new psych ward personality. Disordered people flock together on all these platforms. This is going to be the social media murders for criminals. The digital world offers anonymity and a space for dark ideas to flourish. It's a place to connect with like-minded individuals and learn how to commit the perfect crime. Some people use social media to find their prey. Others use it to stalk individuals they already know. What we know is that of the four victims, Maddie and Kaylee, were really the most active. They're on all these different websites, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. If they're throwing their images out there, and then you have suspects that don't know them at all, but they see something that keys into their obsession, their desire, their passion, their anger, or whatever it is, we no longer must have that one-on-one -on -one contact. How many clues, and how many indicators, and how many markers did he leave in the trail from the time he was acting somewhat strange, to the date when he supposedly killed these four innocent victims? Their entire life out there and racking up likes. In some of the girls' videos, a person could see the sliding doors that lead out to the back, and some of the theories about the case argue that there was an opportunistic aspect of it because how well the house was situated. If you're doing videos of your house, you're broadcasting to everyone this is exactly what my house looks like and here's a map of the house. That information can be dangerous if used in the wrong hands. Kaylee told fellow students that she was being physically stalked as well as being contacted online. There was one instance where somebody was following her to a car apparently at the grocery store. There is a theory that people who are rejected in the real world dominate and win on social media. There's a crossover with online predatory behavior with online trolling, and some people think that they take out their anger and rage on new victims. Kohlberger jumps in with two feet. He's on social media. He's looking at the victims. There is also a new report the Kohlberger repeatedly sent direct messages or DM to one of the female victims through Instagram two weeks before the murders. There was a communication where someone said, stop contacting me. There's indications Kaylee's father. Steve had some knowledge of that, but police shut him down as they did not want him talking about it due to the case was still ongoing. 
Social media is gaining access to someone else's life, but just how much can you learn from the pictures and videos? All their social interaction is on social media, and that's where they derive power from, but sometimes the line between online and the real world begins to blur. In the weeks before the attack, Kohlberger's cell phone pinged near the house 12 times, according to a report. He came so close he was even able to connect to the victim's Wi-Fi. He knows from looking at the house and in the TikTok video, he might have said to himself, okay, there are sliding glass doors that allow access to that house, and if he goes and looks, he's going to be able to watch them. After all, that is how he makes entry that night. Police say that he would have needed something to have trigger him or he got angry and was filled with rage. They knew that he went into the restaurant where Maddie and Zana worked on at least one occasion. Maybe he showed up at the restaurant thinking that if there was some sort of conversation. After all, she wants tips, so she's going to be nice, right? The girls had other men around them in their lives, so in his eyes, every man existed except for him. That could fill someone with complete rage. How many times could Berger cross paths with the victims? The night of the crime, he could have been tracking their location too, without ever having to leave his apartment in Pullman, Washington. Maybe he was geotagging them. Geotagging is the practice of tagging your location on a social media platform, where like on Instagram, you can just scroll up, click location, and tag the exact building location area that you're in. And so if you're doing 10 different stories a day on Instagram every time, you're going a new location, you could be tagging that location. That's incredibly dangerous because you're broadcasting here's where I am, here's what I'm doing, and here's who I'm doing it with. These kids are so open about where they go to school, where they hang out after school, where they live, what their room looks like, what their house looks like, and what apps they're on if Kaburger did have malign intent, he's got the keys to the kingdom. They are looking into what Kaburger shared about his own life online. Reports show that he is up at 4 a.m. and on social media sites. Then there are the other apps that the prosecutors have dropped legal process on that they must have some indication he was active on Tinder, Twitter, Dropbox, YK Yak, Reddit, Facebook, TikTok, and Strava. November 13th, 2022, just hours after the murders, Kaburger drove 84 miles to Johnson, Idaho, which butts up against the Pierce National Forest. Cell phone towers can place a user in general vicinity, but they can't pinpoint a specific location. At that point, it could be a 20-mile square location, but GPS can be a meter. Could the GPS coordinates from Strava give authorities more insight into the exact locations while he visited Johnson, Idaho? The locations on the Strava app gave the police an area he could have been. That area is a reservoir because there are quarries up there. That means water. The police don't have the knife. They don't have the bloody clothing. He didn't even have a shower curtain in the Washington apartment. There's a lot of evidence missing. Those items could be there. There are indications that after the murders, he was engaging online and correcting people. This wouldn't be the first time Kaburger has taken to the social media site to discuss violent crime. In May of 2022, only six months before the murders, Kaburger asked criminals to complete an anonymous online survey on Reddit about how and why they break the law. Just for the sake of scientific inquiry, try to imagine, is there any scenario in which a person would be asking those questions on a form? Maybe Kaburger is fantasizing about the crime he commits, and he wants to be reinforced that these people are out there that haven't been caught doing his survey and reinforced that he can commit this crime and then he will not be caught. And the thing about fantasy is not something that just comes out of nowhere. It's something that usually lives in the person's mind for a long time, and it takes different shapes and forms when you are talking about personality traits. It's not something that you just see as a shift when you're 28 years old. You see a lot of those borderline traits from a young age, and then they just really evolve over the years. And on this survey, he's asking criminals how you feel. Are you depressed? How do you feel after the crime? Before the crime? Around the June time frame, he buys a K-bar knife online. At the murder scene, there was a knife sheath found. They got some DNA off that knife case. 
Police didn't need the knife sheath that the car was the biggest break in the case. Very early on, the police got neighborhood videos of this white vehicle not only cruising around several times and then parking, but then speeding away at about the same time that they bracketed the time of death of the four victims. This vehicle that they did connect to Kaburger becomes so important because it ties Kaburger's car of which Kaburger said he had possession of which Kaburger is caught with in Pennsylvania to the crime scene before and after the murders. The vehicle is huge. Even if he didn't leave the knife sheath, it probably wouldn't have made much difference because that is the only DNA that he left at the scene. The revelation is that a roommate of the victim saw the alleged killer having opened her bedroom door because she heard crying and a male voice saying, it's okay, I'm going to help you. That roommate told police she saw a man who was dressed entirely in black walking towards her. She hurriedly shot and locked her bedroom door. The man left the building. Police say that man was Brian Kaberger. She already described the one thing that wasn't solicited by a detective. He wasn't athletic, but he was slim, slightly muscular with bushy eyebrows. When she said that the police are thinking he's got a ski mask on because all she's seeing is this much, and she doesn't describe his hair, which is distinctive race. She didn't give a race. The police have a feeling she cracked the door enough to see him walk down the stairs, and then Zana made some overture, some exclamation, and he went to her. She shuts the door. The strangest thing is that after she met Kaberger in the hallway, she did not call the police for seven hours. That's probably the biggest hole right there. The defense attorneys can amplify little things like that in front of a jury. It's not even clear that she called the police. The first call was apparently to friends. The friends came over, and then they used her phone apparently to call the police. The police got the white Elantra, and he fits the description. When the police investigate his background here at the University of Washington, he's about to be fired and subsequently was because he's having trouble with women and so on. He fits a lot of their profile. They grab his garbage with no expectation of privacy. They don't even need a warrant. They were minimalists because the more they gave, the more the defense and the defendant would know. And they had something to protect. What don't we know? Has a knife been recovered? As for the clothing, there was multiple places he could have disposed of it in water and land. He was quite active after the murders, I think, that they were very cautious about how far they went, and then ultimately what happened is I think it worked against them a little bit. He blows town, and he takes that mobile crime scene with him. Now nobody travels 2,300 miles to go visit your parents at Christmas, and then drive 2,300 miles back, Desperate people do desperate things. When that news started tightening, human instincts turned into animal instincts. He changes the license plate drives across country. He wants to get the car out of the state. He had a game plan to get rid of the car, sell it, destroy it, or store it. He was definitely taking steps to cover his tracks. We don't know what they got out of the car, but I would be shocked if they didn't get a little bit of blood from one of the victims in that car that was on him or something on his gloves. Or on the knife, he had to put the knife down on the seat. This is really a battle over DNA evidence. Police found some touched DNA at the crime scene and maybe on the knife sheath. They did not get the DNA off Kohlberger himself, but God is off the family from the trash that was outside on the curb at his home in Pennsylvania. Three of the four victims were found dead in their beds, apparently killed while they slept. One, Kaylee was found upright, slumped against the wall as her parents told the media at the time. The house where the four students were murdered was torn down on December 28, 2023. This was done overruling the objections made by victims' families. University President Scott Green said, While we appreciate the emotional connection some family members of the victims may have to this house, it is time for its removal and to allow the collective healing of our community to continue. Gruesome details of the crime have begun to come to light one year after the slayings. There was so much blood. It had seeped through the wooden floors and run down the building's gray concrete foundation in jagged red rivulets. That's the reason they wanted it to be destroyed and move on past this event. 
Only Dylan Mortensen and Bethany Funk survived the ordeal that night. Dylan was the only one who came face to face with the killer that night. The two women were also allegedly texting each other while the murders were happening and received an onslaught of hatred online after it was revealed that no one called 911 for several hours after the quadruple slayings happened. The judge in this case, Judge John Judge, has made a recent statement that cameras would be allowed in the courtroom. The trial date is expected to be still far off in March to June 2025. Thank you Ava for another interesting show, as always. Thanks for joining us and hope that you enjoyed our latest podcast. Please follow us on the links in our channel page. And leave a review, and again if you did not do already, hit that subscribe button. Thanks again and see you here next time.